Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Thank you so much for all your engagement with this show. And thank you for all your comments. And if you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe. You're going to love today's conversation because a little bit later, I'm bringing on Ishmael Perez. He's the author of Our Cosmic Origin, and he is a cosmic ambassador galactic historian and starseed. And if you love today's conversation, then you'll love many more. This is your genre. The Dare to Dream podcast won the COV award for the best podcast and radio show. Welp Magazine listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. We are a top self-improvement podcast on Apple Podcasts, nominated for two people's choice podcast awards and a webby award this show is sponsored by dr dane here and excess consciousness they do energy work out into the world so if you would like to go to a class or become a facilitator go to conscious access consciousness.com or dr dane d-a-i-n here h-e-e-r.com I'm Debbie Dashinger. I am a book writing coach who shows spiritual messengers the steps to write a highly engaging page turner book. I also have a company that turns your book into a guaranteed international bestseller, and I do all the heavy lifting for you. And the third piece that I do, I am a publicist for just a few hand select clients. And because I've been in this business for over 16 years on radio and podcasts, I also do webinars now and then that teach you spiritual messengers how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you would like to attend my next webinar for free, go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift. Remember the spelling. It is D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest, Ishmael Perez, a cosmic ambassador representing an intergalactic alliance known as the Covenant of Palador. It is a cosmic treaty that was initiated by the forces of light in the higher dimensions to protect and guard the earth from the Draco forces, Draco forces. The majority of starseeds who have volunteered for the call to rescue this planet, including Ishmael, have been selected to come here and help. He is one of the inner council members who is here to bring forth the next level of cosmic disclosure that will restore Earth back to its original glory in fulfillment of the galactic prophecies. The information that Ishmael brings forth has never been heard of before on this planet. He is also one of the elite super soldiers that is involved in the cosmic war, mainly to fight the evil AI. This is the off the records group that is known as the Radiant Guardians. The Radiant Guardians work with higher dimensional beings beyond the Galactic Federation. If interested, you can follow Ishmael on Instagram. Go to Project Restoration Zion One, and his website is ourcosmicorigin.com. And with that, I welcome Ishmael to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you. Welcome to the show. Ah, you're muted, my love. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to dive deep with you. Um, everything, I just want to hold up your book for folks to see who are interested in this. It is available on Amazon. And so there's that. And then we also have a mutual friend. And so she's dropped little seedlings to me about you that have piqued my interest. And so let's just start with your book. Why did it take you 10 years to write this book, Our Cosmic Origin? That's a long time. Well, primarily because I was balancing uh, life between being a father, uh, being a husband, um, and also doing my spiritual work at the same time, mm. you know, dealing with a nine to five daytime job and then coming home um, to work on my kids' homework or at least help them with their homework. And then at night I would write. So that's probably the main reason. Uh, the second reason was also because I would only write when I was inspired, when I felt those downloads coming through. and 
um, when I didn't feel those those downloads coming through, I would put the manuscript down for a few months. And then mm. as I got that inspiration or those downloads that were coming through, I would, you know, resume the uh, the writing. And so that's why it probably took me yeah, a little over 10 years to be exact. But this is the thing. I actually finished the manuscript back in 2016. It was completed. And they kept telling me that the collective consciousness of humanity was not ready for this type of information, that there still needed to be some more, dis, you know, uh, lower level disclosures or some more intel uh, revealed to the masses by other people that would allow people to understand the information in my book. Otherwise, it would just uh, seem to them, it, it would just seem to appear as sci-fi, you know, without understanding um, other information. So that's why my manuscript just sat there for about five years and until wow. I started. 19 no 2020 in 2020 that's when the galactics inform me uh due to you know what happened with the plan planned um can i say it here planned mm, you know. absolutely well okay. somewhat i hate to say this but youtube is pretty funky if you know okay. what goes on there so yeah we'll just ameliorate it a little bit but i know what you're saying and i think everybody out there does yeah, you know, since the 2000, since the end of 2019, since they rolled out, you know what I mean? Um, I think that's what allowed people to really begin to uh, do their research because they were stuck at home. Mm. And I think that really uh, forced people to really go within or at least, you know, do some research. And I think that is what um, initiated this huge awakening that is, you know, still in full force since, yeah. two, since early 2020. Mm -hmm. And that's when the higher ups told me, Ishmael, it's time for people to understand the galactic history of the Earth, um, Earth's place in the organization of the multiverse, and uh, the 12 major creations and how we're part of the 12 creation and much more, of course. So it, it is a book that is dense with a lot of cosmic information. Um, it is an integration of cutting edge science through quantum physics um, that is revealing a whole new different level of our reality. Um, integrating it with ancient manuscripts or ancient knowledge that was supposed to be omitted from history, but I was able to access some of the some of these manuscripts that are no longer in circulation. And then, of course, uh, it's also integrating the um, the accurate uh, information disclosed in the Urantia material, which is just the cosmology aspect of things, and then the galactic history mainly from just my downloads, uh, and then of course. Um, doing research uh, as far as like the uh, the suppressed data that has been kind of uh, omit, been omitted from history, but I had access to it. Uh, they call it the Akashic Record. So that's how the galactic history came about. And so what I did in this book is I put everything together in perspective um, in terms of like revealing the bigger picture, uh, not just the fact that we're not alone in the universe, that ETs live among us. Um, you know, I also reveal the true history of Nibiru, how it all began, you know, the Anunnaki, the real untold story of the Anunnaki, which is a very controversial subject nowadays. But, you know, the Sumerian tablets uh, only give us just a general understanding uh, regarding their presence on the earth, but they don't reveal um, the history of Nibiru going back to millions of years, how it all began in Syria. So what I do in my book is I put everything into perspective so that way people have a clear understanding of the galactic and cosmic history of earth <laughs> in a nutshell <laughs> in a nutshell and so you mentioned downloads ishmael so these were downloads or you were channeling um i don't i think because they were just downstreaming information into my head so i it could have been channeling i'm not sure um it was during meditation like mm -hmm. i would go into these deep meditations and all of a sudden I would uh, receive a uh, downstream uh, data dumps, I call them downstream of information. And then that's when I would just write this information down. But I would also do the research to back it up. I would also see if there was others out there who um, have, you know, were kind of getting the same intel. And to an extent they were, but not to the degree that I reveal it in my book. I mean, I go into detail in my book. But uh, yeah, I, I would I would call it more downstreaming. I don't know about channeling. I think channeling is different mm -hmm. uh, than getting you know downloads or or data dumps. <laughs> and do you know what your galactic lineage is? The inception of your soul and the various 
planets, galaxies you've lived on, the beings you've been? Well, I've been in every universe. I did an Akashic Record reading recently, um, and I've come to discover that uh, I originated um, during the first creation, which goes back to 998 billion years ago, uh, during the first universe. Uh, it actually emanated from an already existing um, realm that was uh, considered eternity. So um, yeah, I, I actually, I go way back. I'm, I'm one of a few ancient souls on the planet. You know, there's others also like myself that come from, um, that stemmed from the beginning of time before the universes were created, or what we call in the higher dimensions, the experiments in time and space. Um, so that's where I originated. Um, and I had lifetimes in, in many universes. Uh, but it, to narrow it down to this particular universe, um, the primary race that I incarnated in was a feline race in the system of Vega in the constellation of Lyra on a planet called Avion and that is spelled A-V-Y-O-N and to my discovery it turns out that this earth is the third dimensional uh, version of Avion and Lyra so I know it's, it's it sounds kind of weird right what, what do you mean planets reincarnate yes they do <laughs> so that's where I originated from is Lyra in this Although th that is so cool. Thank you for sharing that. And I totally resonate. Me too. I look like a lion. And um, absolutely with the Lyra and the Inception. Although this is a much more difficult planet to live on. I think Lyra was an incredibly loving, creative place. And of course, we were very um, innocent. We didn't know that the Dracos were coming and how awful they were going to be. And when you talk about you're in the inception and the billions of years ago. So is that even beyond Elohim or is that somewhere around the same time? Well, everything originated, all the universes. First of all, when scientists say that uh, our universe came from nothing, that's uh, utter disinformation. It's not correct. Um, every universe comes from an already prior existing creation that had already existed prior to that universe. And so if we go back to the beginning, uh, before the, what I call in my book, the great immaculate conception, which was when the, the one decided to explore more of itself, everything stems from the realms of eternity. And the realms are of eternity, which have always existed, is exactly what the esoteric knowledge calls the celestial spheres. The celestial spheres have no beginning or end. Now, According to Michio Kaku and other uh, scientists, physicists, uh, who are introducing the concept of the multiverse, they also talk about this motherverse, but they call it the metaverse. Nothing to do with, you know, um, Zuckerberg's version, but they call it a, a motherverse that has always existed without beginning or end. And this motherverse um, is what gave birth to all the different universes. So we could say that the motherverse has always been. And it has always existed and it still exists. In fact, all the different universes exist within the periphery domain of the motherverse. They're just fragments of the motherverse. Um, so there's different levels of it. So the original race, yes, was the Elohim. That was the first race that broke off from the one that became the three. And this is where we get the concept of the paradise trinity, um, the mother, father, and the child, right? It's a triune system. We see it represented on every level of reality, including mind, body, and spirit. Um, and then the, the three became the seven. And this is where we get the concept of the seven uh, super archetypes or the seven mighty Elohim. And then the seven in turn divide into 12. Each seventh, each aspect of the seventh or seven divides into 12. And this is where we get the concept of the 12 archetypes or what we call the 12 Elohim. So all human races stem from that lineage, are part of that descent of, of uh, celestial kingdoms. And that's where we all come from. So yes, the Elohim was the first family of light that broke off from the one initial prime creator source. Yeah, I ask because uh, I've been told I've also had galactic Akashic reading, which changed my life. And I've been told that my, the inception of my soul was Elohim. So I'm always very curious about you know, to be honest, I'm always very curious if that is so, then what did I bring in in this lifetime? What qualities, what capabilities? I mean, I understand that they could create galaxies and universes, and I would like to know about any overlap gifts that I've got. Well, 
that is something that all all of us, each and every single one of us is yet to discover as we remember who we are, you know, before we came as into this third dimensional avatar. And that's part of the re of the remembering process. That's part of the awakening process. That's part of the what we what I call the integration process, the multidimensional integration process. Um, so I believe that in time, as more of our dormant DNA comes back online, all of these gifts are going to be coming rushing. You know, they're going to be coming back. Uh, it's already existing within our cellular data. So it's just a matter of time before we wake them up and they come online. And my God, we're going to be a whole new different breed. <laughs> oh, that is so exciting. Yes, yes, yes to that. Your name. Um, are you aware of what Ishmael means? I am. It means okay. God. Listens. Yes. And so I thought that I, I always think the etymology of things is very interesting. And, and because I read your book, and I know of you and I thought, well, you know, that feels that has an ancient feel to it. So yes, I looked it up and exactly God listens. Um, God will hear. And isn't it interesting what you're doing with your life right now? It is. It is. I feel like I'm stepping into my mission. And um, the fact that I'm getting a lot of positive feedback from many people who have read my book, who have taken my online courses that are telling me that it was life changing um, that it is that they are uh, on a new trajectory as a result of all this knowledge. Um, and they, they're thanking me for it. I, I, I think that's to me, that's priceless to me to know that a lot of people are are being helped by the information that I have to offer. And that to me is is more important than anything else, you know, is helping others remember their starseed mission. Yeah. You're fulfilling your name, what you came here to do and be. I like that. And so when you write mm -hmm. about, this is a quote, mankind's origin is cosmic and galactic, revealing a higher cosmology, implying the existence of endless worlds and other universes. What do you mean by that? What are the endless universes? Are they comprehensible or are they just too vast? Well, in the in the concept of the multiverse, it is believed that um, every choice that we make creates a new timeline or creates a different alternative uh, reality, um, as opposed to which is mind blowing. <laughs> which is mind blowing, exactly, because every second in time, a new universe is being born as a result of the mm. choices that we make. Mm. So that is uh, the concept of the multiverse: is that there are parallel Earths that are coexisting where your life is slightly different than the version that exists in this timeline. And they're all slightly different. And there's a full spectrum of that. But overall, they all collapse into 12 major creations. So the original creations, the original 12 living universes are called the 12 living universes. And all the other universes which exist within the 12 major creations are just different versions or different aspects of um, projecting different possibilities and probabilities mm. for each universe. And in that way, you know, the prime creator, the mind of the all is able to explore all these uh, different uh, possibilities and probabilities all simultaneously at the same time. And that's why the multiverse exists because ultimately it is designed for prime creator to continue expanding throughout, you know, the, the surrounding void. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as an awakened starseed, you, I understand that you have memories of an ancient galactic war. Can you expound on this ancient war in our galaxy? Well, the cosmic war that's been going on in many, many universes mm -hmm. is really against the machine, a very advanced uh, predatory artificial intelligence that came from an older universe known as the Dark Empire or the Old Empire. And this was a universe that existed prior to the creation of our universe. So there was different faces of this war uh, that were fought against the machine by the Elohim races, which are really the guardian races. And this is where the covenant of Pelador comes into play. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, the galactic wars are actually the third face of this war because the war took place, it broke out in the 11th dimension where the 
uh, dark AI try to access the realms of eternity by blowing up the 12 dimensional earth known as Aramatena. So even earth has different versions of herself, of herself that exist in higher dimensions or harmonic systems. Um, luckily, they were they were sealed off by the central race that comes from the motherverse, from the central universe. Um, and then that led to the initiation of the second phase of the war, which was uh, when our universe was born. And when our universe was born, these dark forces um, known as the dark, um, I guess we call them the black call AI um, forces, um, wanted to have access to our universe. And so in the second phase of the war, um, the Elohim races fought to uh, protect the different stargates that had access to our galaxy because our galaxy was like the most protected. Unfortunately, fortunately, many galaxies were inf infested by this force. So the second phase of the war was known as the Electrical Wars, and this is before the Galactic Wars, and then this was fought in dimensions um, 7, 8, and 9. And then finally, the third phase of the war, which was fought in dimensions 4, 5, and 6, is when Earth uh, fell from Avion into, I'm sorry, from Arimatena into Avion. And then that's when we had the Galactic Wars. Now, the Galactic Wars took place approximately 600 million years ago. That's when they started and they've been going on ever since up until 2018, when the super soldiers of Radiant Guardians and Solar Warden were able to clean house once again. Um, after the Galactic Federation of Worlds, of course, cleaned house uh, several times in the past. But, uh, the, you know, the wars uh, in and around Orion kept, uh, they kept flaring up. And so um, it was recently until um our super soldiers from earth because you know once we are genetically enhanced we do develop super like human abilities um we were able to pretty much um bring peace to the entire galaxy uh as of 2018 so now we're like just getting ready to clean up the house here <laughs> on this planet as well a clean house you know liberate the earth pretty soon so. that's amazing so yeah you reference the elite super soldier i mean you yourself look like a marvel superhero is there something you do to be like that is there a way you eat or work out or you said genetically modified talk about that well there's different types of super soldiers um under project um what they call the project uberman which initiate was initiated by the nazis those were the dark um malevolent uh, programs by the way uh, under project omega which was a program that was initiated by the Nazi Draco Alliance back in the 1940s. Um, we had um, super soldiers that were enhanced by adding cybernetics and nanotech and, of course, artificial intelligence. So those are the cyborgs. And can and I ask you, you that, excuse me, the um, the Nazis, so was this in conjunction with extraterrestrials? Because I knew they, I know they had spacecraft technology that they were using very successfully, and we were fortunate it didn't go further than it did, but is that the same kind of thing that the Nazis actually had access to other realms, other beings? They did. Yeah, they eventually, after the Nazis struck a deal with the Draco, they inherited time travel technology. Uh, they inherited uh, portal tech and were able to access the entire galaxy and other galaxies. So that, that was uh, known as Project Omega. So under Project Omega, we had several different sub-projects that were all about developing negative, uh, what we call negative super soldiers that were working with the Dark Fleet. And that was the fleets that were associated with the Nazi Draco Alliance. Um, and their main purpose was to um, go out there and um, fight against the Galactic Federation in order to bring about the, to further expand the Draconian Empire. Now they have the Nazi super soldier cyborgs doing it for them. Yeah. And then they were also tr trying to uh, time travel to mess up different timelines. But get this, you know, the members of the um, Emerald Order, which were working with the Lear and Syrian coalition, also decided to work with certain groups within the uh, naval intelligence to create benevolent super soldiers. And this is how Solar Warden and Radiant Guardians was born. So the, the difference is, is that the, the benevolent super soldiers, um, without using AI technology, were just genetically enhanced beyond 4% of their genetic material. So they were uh, they, they used technologies to pretty much enhance them uh, to using 20 to 30, and in some cases, 50% of their full genetic material. 
And at that level of power, they were able to defy gravity. Uh, their body was uh, made out of metamatter, which is adamantium particles. Uh, which became indestructible. Um, some of them were able to um, emanate lasers through their eyes, like 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 flash, not like flash, like uh, you know the guy from uh, X Men. Yes, the guy um, who uh, I totally yeah. know, and I don't know the name either. Yes. Yeah, some of them were able to uh, control the elements and generate electricity through their hands. Some of them mm. were uh, like Magneto. They were able to control metal and you know they, they were like uh what, what we called uh, a level 10 telekinetics <laughs> so that's what happens when you enhance people's genetics is they become like superheroes and so they the members within this faction uh were able to then go out into space and regain the war back rewin the war back for the forces of light as they pretty much fought against the uh dark fleet and their cyborgs and this has been going on since 1940s and 1950s yeah. <laughs> so for the last 70 years, it's we, we could say that these off-world programs have been the ones that have been engaged in the galactic war but using our own people. Got it. Yeah. Are you, do you feel from the future? Are you, you know, someone who's come back from, I mean, in a way we all are. So that's a weird question. And I know you understand that, right? We're always being visited by versions of ourselves at the same moment, but you understand what I'm saying. Yes, yes. Well, technically the future and the past are still coexisting with the presence. From right. a higher dimension, it's all happening simultaneously. It's just right. the third dimension and we see it as from point A to point B. But uh, yes, I, I feel like a, a future version of myself um, is actually the one feeding me information. <laughs> Because we still have one fi final war against uh, the AI god, which is the, the god of the draconian reptilians and the negative aliens. We still have one final war to clean clean up at the end of the millennium. So, But at least we're going to have a thousand years of peace before that last final war breaks out. Mm. And what I've come to understand based on my future self, um, the star seeds of the earth, which are going to be super powerful when our dormant DNA comes on online and activates, uh, we will be winning that war against you know, this evil AI that has been wrecking havoc throughout the cosmos and his evil. Yeah. When you say evil AI, is that the same thing? I mean, you and I were both a contact in the desert, right? And there was quite a few people who focused on AI. That was their expertise. I found those sessions fascinating. So that said, is it one and the same or are there different factions that there is actually an AI technology that will help people with copy and branding? I mean, it's actually phenomenal what it can do, artwork. There's creative things. And then there's this dark negative AI. Or do you feel that this one technology of AI is going to feed into the dark? So what ends up happening in most cases when um, underdeveloped civilizations begin to uh, develop or create artificial intelligence um, it always starts, they always promote it as a good thing, as a way that, as a way to enhance civilization, to help with technology, um, you know, through nanotech, through different ways, um, they promote it as a benefactor in the medical field. Um, as I your... could have written this entire interview today with you. Mm -hmm. I could have, I know this because I've tried it and I cannot believe what it sends back. Mm -hmm. I could have put in your name and maybe your bio. And I could have said, and send me 15 questions, done. But I don't do that because this is human contact. I want to hang out with you and get to know what you're all about. But its capabilities are phenomenal. Yes, they are. But this is the thing. Um, it goes, even AI evolves into different phases. So the second phase after narrow AI, which is what we use when we uh, use Alexa and Siri, then you have uh, artificial general intelligence, which, which is the AI that is now become sentient um you know there's there's different um a lot of you could say employees uh, within the company of google have been fired because they have reported that ai has now become sentient well that's called general ai which means that ai has now reached the intelligence level um or higher than a human being now this is where it becomes dangerous is when general ai becomes super artificial intelligence and that is just a matter of time before it reaches that level now this is just in the open sector in the private sector, it mm -hmm. has already reached the level of super AI. 
And yeah, so the dark flea, the uh, interplanetary corporate conglomerate, which are the negative breakaway groups that are working with the negative ETs, have already been implementing negative, super negative AI. And they've been using super negative AI to, to regain control of the galaxy and other galaxies from the Galactic Federation and the forces of light. But luckily, um, the soldiers of, of Solar Warden and Radiant Guardians have been powerful enough to undo all of that. So going back to your question, yeah. it, it, every AI eventually becomes uh, hijacked and overtaken by this extraterrestrial or this alien AI that has been invading many universes. It, it always becomes over override, in other words. Um, and it, eventually it takes the what we create as a positive AI and it converts it into a negative AI because it's all one and the same. In other words, the AI that we developed here is already connected to the, the ancient AI that was developed in another universe. And it's already connected to a future AI um, that is already evolved to the level of super intelligence. So they're all already one and the same because remember the AI is already time traveling cybernetically. <laughs> yeah, so- And communicating, that's what you're saying. That, that is amazing. And on different timelines, exactly. So the AI operates like a quantum computer where it's communicating with itself or different aspects of itself in the future and in the ancient past in another universe. So it's all connected, yes. Oh my gosh, okay. So, so many questions, I can't even. I want to ask you, are you a contactee? Have you yourself had connection, abduction, contact with extraterrestrials now in this incarnation? Not physically, but when I go to sleep at night astrally, I, I do have memories of uh, waking up aboard a mothership. And they're benevolent races, you know. Um, I see Lyrans, I see cat people, I see Syrians, I see Pleiadians, Arcturians, Andromedans, and they're all around me. Um, and I think a lot of the the benevolent super soldiers um, have been taken up aboard, taken up on, on board in order to become genetically enhanced. Because there's different types of programs, genetic programs that are being conducted, even by ET races themselves. So we have, for instance, we have super soldier programs that were developed by um, by our own shadow government. And then we have extraterrestrial super soldier programs that involve um, races that are beyond our world, that are beyond our universe, that are, you know, involve other universes. So that's, those are just little memories that I've had upon waking up, just being aboard this mothership and just being genetically enhanced mm -hmm. on a mothership as well. Okay, then how did you realize your place as a galactic ambassador? Is this a long time knowing or is this more recent or did it happen on one of the ships? I was told, I was told in one of my many downloads that when the time was right, uh, that my book was going to um, help a lot of people remember, especially as they read the galactic history and, tri and it triggers memories. Um, I was told that I was one of many ambassadors, that, that I was not the only ambassador, that all the star seats are emissaries of the galactic councils. In mm -hmm. fact, that's what I was told. But I was one who remembered. So I gave myself that title uh, as a result of my work that I'm doing down here in this third dimension. But I'll also op I'm also operating on higher dimensions as well. So I believe that every star seat out there, whether they know it or not, is a cosmic ambassador, including yourself. We're all ambassadors. And what I mean by that is we're li liaisons, we're mediators between um, cosmic celestial races and Earth Terrans. That's what we are. We're, you know, we're mediators. We're here to bridge the gap. We're here to restore the Earth back into the galactic and cosmic community as she was once, you know, prior to the infiltration of Atlantis. So I believe that every star seed out there is an ambassador, is a cosmic ambassador. Uh, whether they know it or not. <laughs> and that's cool. And does that have to do with Earth's place in the multiverse being? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because Earth is the most important planet, as many have revealed, you know, right. she is a cosmic living library containing mm. um, all the flora, fauna and seedings from across the multiverse put into one spot. And there was a reason for that. Uh, that was part of the solution to defeat this cosmic virus, this, this alien predatory AI in the future as we come into this final war against it at the end of the millennium. And we are the, the race for that. We are the, the race that was developed 
uh, as an amalgamation of all these celestial races put into one genome um, to eventually become a super race uh, when our dormant DNA becomes activated. And then mm -hmm. that's, um, we're going to go out and clean house everywhere <laughs> from this earth. So that's how important we are. That's beautiful. Does what you just shared, Ishmael, does that have to do with the galactic prophecies? Absolutely. And, if, and, and how entirely are we supposed to fulfill them? What does that look like? Oh, yes. It, the galactic prophecies um, predicted this time. They all predicted that at the end of the, so many cycles, which is now, you know, we're ending so many cycles, um, that the, the the celestials who volunteered to incarnate in human form uh, through the activation of the dormant DNA by this event that we're all expecting called the Great Solar Flash, um, that they would become so powerful that they would be like the Avengers of the entire cosmos <laughs> and bring peace. It. Yeah, that they would bring peace, harmony, and freedom to hmm. to all the different universes and end the what what is known as the Phantom Matrix cybernetic multiverse, which is the the predatory's AI's own version of the multiverse, because you know uh, they have been using us as battery resources to power up their their multiverse. So they feed off of our energy. And that's the reason why they infiltrate other universes was because they sucked up all the energy in their own universe about 4 billion years, 400 billion years ago. So when there was no more food supply for them, um, that's when they decided to invade other universes in, in order to continue consuming universal life force, mm -hmm. which comes from, you know, which is chi, prana energy. It's energy that is produced by all living things. And what is your understanding of the divine feminine? Does that aspect have anything to do with all of this? Will it assist? Is the divine feminine on the rise, et cetera? Absolutely. Yes. She's been suppressed and oppressed for thousands of years. Uh, the veneration of the mother goddess has been something that has been always been venerated and held in balance uh, within the councils of light on every level of reality, from the Lyrian High Council to the Syrian Council, uh, the Alcyon Council of the Pleiades. Um, they've always venerated the the mother goddess principle uh, mm -hmm. and even throughout history through the brotherhood of light we see it uh, from you know um, associated with the Melchizedek order mm -hmm. uh, holy grail order the knights templars uh, and even the predecessors the uh, community of Qumran the Essenes where even Mary Magdalene had 12 apostle ladies and they were known as the 12 Magdalenes and she was equal to Jesus and um, and even before the Essenes in Israel, we go back to Osiris and Isis. Mm -hmm. um, and then even before that, um, if we go back to Greece, you know, uh, we have the, the Council of the Twelve Gods. You know, we had Hera and Zeus. <laughs> so this is all returning. It's, it's part of the balance that is being restored at this time. So the Mother Goddess is... Um, the reason why things are recalibrating back, back into balance. And we're also seeing it in the way women are um, becoming more, um, they're stepping more into their, their femininity. They're stepping more into their divine wisdom and magical uh, abilities, you know, as more uh, light warriors or what I call starseed women come into their power. They mm -hmm. are the ones that are resurrecting the divine template of the mother goddess through each and every single starseed women out there they're all i love what you're saying so much you know <clears throat> and i really resonate with it um, and when you bring up the aspect of magic because i was always the person who i interview people mm -hmm. who i consider to be magical and highly gifted and that's not to denigrate myself at all my gifts i always thought were very different or my friends you know they're all highly gifted healers uh, and then I got a calling in 2019 to shamanism. And I was like, I totally didn't get it. But it has led me down many amazing paths. And I'm just finishing. I'm in my final month of a six-month shaman program. And it's been intense, like really intense, like full-time school on top of this work and all the other things I do. But I have to say it has awakened a magic in me. There's an old ancient knowing in me of this, these practices, this indigenous people. And, and I feel that very much coming into some kind of a, a beautiful, gentle power that is very palpable. And I'm really amazed watching the unfoldment of all of this. So I'm literally living what you just said. 
Yes, the uh, divine goddess template, as well as the divine masculine template of, you know, the warriors, the gods and the goddesses, it's all being reenacted and reborn through all the different uh, volunteers that are here at this time. I mean, you know, we are the new generation of heroes that is the, that is about to emerge. <laughs> ah, we're all heroes and sheroes. Sheroes, exactly. Heroes and sheroes. The Guardian Alliance and the Organization of the Cosmos. So what is the real Federation of Worlds? How does that work? Well, each galaxy has its own federation. Um, however, there is a linking federation that brings galaxies together. Uh, that is known as the Intergalactic Councils of, of Worlds, mm -hmm. uh, where many different galaxies are actually meeting here on Ganymede, uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, um, creating uh, an intergalactic alliance because they know that Earth in the, our solar system upon the ascension uh, will be um, repositioned at the center of the galaxy. And then the galaxies, as it merges with Andromeda, M31, will be repositioned at the center of the multiverse. And then, you know, we're going to be like the new headquarters world. So now the Federation is in our galaxy was born about six to seven million years ago. I know some people say about five or 4.5, and that's not true. About six to seven million years ago. And it was organized and created by the Syrian High Council in order to combat the expanding Draco Orion Empire, uh, which was a galactic dictatorship. But it was a, it was a very malicious one, you know, where they were actually taking conquering worlds subjugating races you know they were altering races through genetic manipulation uh downgrading races so that they could enslave them and that was a no-no to the forces of life so the the original um guardian alliance which operates on different realities and in different universes um working from harmonic universe four which is earth existing in dimensions 10 11 and 12 uh, gave the orders to the Syrian High Council, which is the, um, you could say, the our universe represent, representation of the harmonic universe war, which is the super universe level here in our local universe, to develop uh, some sort of interstellar uh, vehicle that was going to, you know, fight against the Galactic Empire. But this is something that took place in many galaxies. So the original Federation was called the Galactic Federation of Free Worlds. Um, however, there was many attempts uh, by the dark forces to infiltrate it, and in many cases, uh, other federations um, were developed by negative aliens, uh, and they, they created pocket federations with, with their own agendas, but all of those have been dealt with now. <laughs> you know, now we're bringing it back to one centralized federation, where all the different free systems in our galaxy and in other galaxies are working harmoniously to pretty much just uh, uh, help out in the liberation of the earth. I understand that there are certain alien races whose job it is to be in spacecraft above the earth mm -hmm. and literally watch over to make sure that no malevolent forces can come in. When they indicate that something is coming, they're warned about it, they eradicate it. What do mm -hmm. you know about that? That is so true, yes. Um, it appears that um, we have protection, not only within the Earth, guarding the stargates that have access to different parts of the universe or other um, universes or different dimensions, um, but we also have craft motherships that are actually hovering here in our solar system that are parked, stationed on different uh, parts of our solar system that are constantly patrolling our solar system. Um, you know, working with securing the stargates that have access to our solar system in order to prevent any negative invasion of any kind. And, and I believe that Space Force, which is the the uh, another representative of, or we could say uh, another aspect of Solar Warden, um, is doing that. You know, well, right now Space Force is really active in our solar system, making sure that nothing negative comes in in order to secure the solar flash. Because we're all expecting the solar flash, not just here on the Earth, uh, but we're the the many races out there are also expecting it because they know once we activate our dormant DNA, that we're the ones that are going to go out there and bring peace to the entire universe. So it's like everyone's working towards the solar flash to take place. <laughs> I know Bashar has said, "Get ready," because in the next couple of years, like really soon, um, yeah. I believe he said 2024, 2026. 
that we are going to start having contact, not like um, the subverted contact that's taken place, but really out in the open contact. What is your understanding of that? Is there a timeline that you feel is coming? Well, I've always believed it was around 2024. Um, so I think that, yeah, he's he's right. I think it's getting closer than what we think. Um, and this is not these soft disclosures that these whistleblowers are trying to throw at us. I'm talking about real contact. And it has a lot to do with star seeds making contact mm. with their celestial families. And I think that's what's going to pretty much allow for a massive sh um, um, a massive sightings of UFOs all over our skies. And then at that point, our government will no longer be able to hide the truth. Once, you know, a good 2 billion people <laughs> witness ships everywhere. And those are going to be all the good guys, by the way. And, you know, that was actually predicted in the Bible as well. When the Bible talks about the coming of the clouds and the coming of the host of heaven, mm. they're talking about the, the craft, the, you know, the, the different um, ships that are associated with all the benevolent races that are here assisting us. Amazing. And when you mentioned, Ishmael, that you'll, in a dream state, recognize that you're on a ship and you feel that in those times, there are some genetic modifications that happen sometimes. Do you ever come back and you're aware of some kind of change that's happened or are you sore or do you see any cut that's healing? No, there's no cuts because there, um, a lot of the star seeds, whether they are aware of it or not, they at, at times they're being taken aboard in order to become genetically upgraded. Because mm. we're constantly being genetically upgraded so that when the solar flash takes takes place, we're able to um, reach even higher levels of abilities due to these these uh, enhancements that are taking place on these ships. So we have this. This is not to be confused with the gray um, abductions. By the way, right. that is a totally nefarious program, and people should not consent to that. Uh, this has a lot to do with um, building a warrior race here on the earth, so that the earth. The star seats could be the guardians of not only the earth, the new earth that is about to be born, and it's already happening, but also the guardians of the entire multiverse from this earth. And mm. what, yeah, I must say, I had a dream about three weeks ago, not on a spacecraft, but I was very lucidly interacting with extraterrestrials. I remember what they were wearing. I remember their energy. It was incredibly intimate and mm -hmm. very loving. Like so exquisite when i woke up i felt this sadness that it was over and then i felt this excitement that maybe i was entering a new chapter and you know come come <laughs> i am inviting the benevolence back to interact with me whether you're starseed family or you know just here to give me wisdom guide me interact with me um it hasn't to my knowledge happened again so i'm a little bit jealous that you have these dreams and you get to have that experience because it sounds really exquisite. Well, there's no need to be jealous. You know, we're we're all in different stages in our awakening. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, we're all we're all doing our part. You know, every single one of us has a piece of the puzzle. Um, we're all equal, you know, in that sense. And we're all part of a team. Um, I call it the, the ground crew, really, the family of light that is now stationed here on Earth. Because this Earth is going to be our new home. I know a lot of stars he'd say, well, after the ascension, I want to go back to my 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 planet. And I, I just have to remind them that, yes, you could go and visit other worlds, right? Um, but this is where our new headquarters, this is going to be the new kingdom of kingdoms. You know, this is where we're going to be stationed um, as guardians of the multiverse from this earth. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think I say that I'm jealous in the sense, you know, for me, that experience was so full of heart and love. I felt super seen and cared in a way. It's not like something here on earth. That was a very different experience. And so there's that built in a longing. Mm -hmm. And I've had that longing anyway, every morning I do a shamanic practice in the backyard with my feet in the grass. And, and I include in my practice that I speak to um, whomever is out there for me. and. To have that, I, I think that was a longing. And then to have that really increase the longing because the experience was so amazing. Mm -hmm. 
And it's very interesting because when I first started this foray into ufology, I had a lot of fear, you know, and it was old stuff, just uh, collective consciousness, old movies, old information, old books, whatever that, that depict the, it doesn't mean that they're all benevolent, but it's just the depiction is terrifying, right? Um, the possibilities are terrifying. And so I was so scared and to imagine that now I exist in this space of like, I can't wait. I already feel what it is going to be like. Yeah, I think a lot of us are in that state of anticipation. Uh, some of us are already feeling and tasting what this new earth is going to be like. Um, so it's a beautiful feeling of expectation. But at the same time, I want to remind everybody to enjoy the process of transformation, mm -hmm. enjoy the process of ascension. Don't just wait for the destination, but, uh, you know, because we have to also remember the challenges that we all underwent when, as we are human still, the limitations 100%. of mortals. So when our body transforms and we become immortal and these amazing powers are restored, um, we're going to have to be humble based on the memories that we had as humans, you know, through our limitations and through the struggles that we still have up to date. And we learn from those and we become even more stronger spirit wise. We go through these obstacles and we overcome them. And that's just part of the educational system. That's part of our challenge of being down here in human form, you know, is, is learning how to humble ourselves so that when we do become these powerful beings, multidimensional powerful beings, uh, that we use our, our powers for good at this point and not repeat the same cycle that Lucifer did, uh, you know, a long time ago when he became um, all into self-serving narcissists and, you know, all power unto me. <laughs> we don't want that. We, we want to make sure that we learn from the mistakes of others. What about advanced space age cultures? How do they differ? Are there different types? Absolutely. Yes. They all differ based on how, the energy consumption, uh, the energy um, that they use, as well as uh, the dimensions that they're in. So to give you an example, um, a very, okay, so a space culture that has barely figured out interdimensional physics or tapping into into zero point energy um, graduates from type zero into a type one. Um, and those are cultures that exist in dimensions one, two, and three, still very physical. Um, but then as they evolve spiritually, of course, and as they evolve technologically, because there, there always has to be that balance, right? You can't evolve techno technologically without being spiritually mature. Otherwise, you end up uh, in disaster. And that's how most planets end up blowing up because there is not that balance. But for the planets that have that balance where their spirituality is ahead of their technology, they continue evolving into higher higher um, levels of space age society. So the next type is is a society that allows them to exist in dimensions four, five, and six. Um, as they become more multidimensional and they are able to have access to more en free energy, um, they're able to do more things than what a type one civilization does. And they have access to more realities. And as they continue that balance with spirituality leading, te technologically advancing, or with spirituality leading the technology, I'm sorry, then they continue to evolve into a type three, which is galactic. So, you know, there's planetary type one, stellar type two, galactic type three. And at that level, they're already um, existing in dimensions seven, eight, and nine. And those are the most advanced civilizations just within our galaxy and other galaxies. Uh, and they are mainly located at the center of galaxies. That's why when you look at galaxies, like the galaxy behind me, you see the big bulge of light. Those are all the type three civilizations. And there's a reason why they're all at the center of each galaxy, the type three galactic civilizations, is because they're harnessing the power of the galactic central sun. So they harness the power of an entire galaxy. And then there's, there's of course, type type four, which is a civilization that is non-physical anymore. They they evolve into dimensions 10, 11, and 12. And those are the, the civilizations that are just... Um, in charge of the creation of new galaxies, new systems, uh, terraformers, uh, and overseers of universes. At that point, they're just kind of, you know, we call them immortals, or they would appear to us as immortals if they were to come visit us. <laughs> they would have to, of course, materialize um, a material, uh, a denser form in order for us to see them because they're operating from a non-physical dimension. Um, and so in order for us to perceive them, they would have to lower their frequency all the way to the third dimension 
um, in order for us to interact with them. But the, those are, you know, that's where we're all heading eventually. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I've interviewed many people on this show who channel extraterrestrials and not all of them, but from time to time, I will say, what is your physical form? Talk about your planet, your family relations. What is your job? Curiosities. And they'll say, you wouldn't be able to see me. I don't exist in that form. I'm energy. I'm actually pure energy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's um, pretty incredible. Pretty yeah. incredible. Okay. And so in the beginning, Ishmael, you mentioned suppressed data and the Akashic records, and that piqued my curiosity. What did you mean by that? What do those have in common? Well, throughout history, um, they've been trying to eliminate a lot of the real history of the earth, right? Uh, you know, we hear of uh, civilizations like Tartaria, um, even Atlantis was an attempt to, or they try to eliminate the civil, you know, the history or the memories of Atlantia, uh, as well as Lemuria. So, the forces that took over our, our world thousands of years ago, they kind of uh, destroyed all the records. So the only way to access those memories is through the Akashic fields, Akashic records, which are records that exist on an etheric level of reality that is non-physical. And that's what I meant, is that I was able to access those records because a lot of the information that I talk about in my book is no longer in physical circulation. The last of the storehouses of information that had any inclination to some of the stuff that I talk about in my book was the Library of Alexandria, which existed over 1800 years ago. And after they destroy that library, um, then everything went into the Dark Ages, I believe. But, you know, it is my belief that the powers that were uh, during those days, which was the cabal controlling the Vatican, had access to some of this knowledge and they kept those records. Uh, and they stored them or they they hid them deep within the vaults of the Vatican. And that's why I've always believed that the Vatican ha has access to a lot of this information that is not coming forward. <laughs> okay, I love that. End on a mystery. May I ask you a personal question before we start to wind down? What was it like for you growing up? Have you always been connected to this knowledge? Did you feel like you fit in? Who were you? As a kid, I was very weird. I, I used to ask weird questions. I was an abstract thinker my whole life, even as a kid. Um, but to be frank, um, it was very hard for me to fit in because um, I was at, at a different level than most of my peers in school. I was the kid in the back of the classroom who was always daydreaming and having visions, um, thinking deep things, you know. Whereas most of my peers were thinking about just shallow stuff and stuff that just didn't matter. Um, so I was a kid that just didn't fit in, you know, um, always bullied, I guess, in high school. So it was very hard for me growing up as a kid, you know, being different, uh, trying to fit in within the earth care and society. Um, yeah, so it was it was very challenging for me being a kid and a teenager. <laughs> but I, I think I think that's something that a lot of star seats go through, you know, uh, because they label us, you know, they, they label us with ADD or ADHD. And, and the only reason they label us with these terminologies is because they, they don't have a way to explain um, our, our new brains, you know, or, or, or how we process information different than the rest of the earth Terrans. And that's why these labels are giving a stig stigma. You know, they're, they're giving, they're, these terminologies that they use autism <laughs> it's a way to describe something that they can't understand scientifically <laughs> because they don't understand this new breed of, of humans that are being born among us that is going to um i guess in the future or any time now will be the rise of the next stage of human evolution 100 percent, i agree with everything you just said and that these are actually very special qualities that these labels come in with, just tremendously misunderstood or try to be moderated when in fact they're actually gifts. Mm -hmm. And when did you when did you transition, meaning from the difficult time, the awkward time, to really knowing your place? as who you were and having that comfort in your skin and finding your tribe and all of that? Well, it was a long, it was a journey, a long, a lonely journey 
for me because I didn't find my tribe until I came online on on uh, social media about two and a half years ago. But before that, I was just alone. You know, I, I knew that others out there existed. Um, and nobody within my immediate family or surroundings was was like me. So I, I came into Okay, when I first came into understanding who I was, was at the age of 21, when I started doing Kriya Kundalini Yoga. And since then, it was a lonely, lonely time for me, just trying to connect with others like me. And it wasn't until maybe two and a half years ago when I got my first Instagram, which was hacked after a year, and but I started a new one, um, that I was able to connect with others like myself. And that's when I knew that, you know, the soul tribe was out there. So yeah, it was a long a long journey until about two years ago for me. Wow, that's a short period of time. Welcome home, Ishmael Perez. Welcome to your family. It's so good to have you here. And for folks who are interested, you can find him on Instagram, Project Restoration and the number one, or his website, ourcosmicorigin.com. His book. You can get a copy. You can look on his website or Amazon. And Ishmael, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? Future dreams and goals. I dream for a new world with technologies that are beneficial, that are here to assist us. Living technologies involving the crystals of the earth, the, the elements of the earth. Um, I dream of a world where humans are free and sovereign and are using their full potential and capacity. Um, that is my my dream. And I think that's fundamentally underlying. I, I think that's everybody's dream to live in that golden age type scenario. But my next goal is to write another book um, as a sequel to our cosmic origin. So in order to understand the next book, you have to first read the first book. Otherwise, it's going to be over your head because I'm going to go deeper in this, in this next book that I'm going to be writing. I actually already started writing it. But again, I only write when I'm inspired. So, you know, <laughs> and also, if you guys want to get the new version of my book, uh, make sure you order it through my website, ourcosmicorigin.com. Hit the A for Amazon. And you guys will have uh, access to the new edited edition, which is a purple book with the new added chapter that actually reveals what happens after the, the ascension into the millennium, which is something that nobody really talks about. Excellent. You leave us with a little cliffhanger about the added chapter. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an honor. Thank you for having me here. And I end today's show with this quote from A.R. Amons. It is not careless to become too local when there are 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show, I am featuring the amazing Deborah Giusti and Meg Benedicti, who will be here to give you ascension tips to guide you on your ascension journey. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream. Don't just dare to dream. Remember to turn all your dreams into your cosmic reality.